Good morning. Oh, it wasn't here last week. I um, I had a short deadline from a client, so I um, was busy with that, so I'm back. But then I realized just a few minutes ago, next week is Christmas, the week after that is New Year. So I'm not going to be doing this for a few weeks, but I'm still watching movies. So certainly check out my website, howardforfilm.com, Howard, F-O-R, film.com, um, and then you can read my reviews. Or go to my Facebook page, Howard for Film. Anyhow, um, I got three movies to talk about this week. The first one um, I saw at the, um, at the International Film Festival and Awards in Macau. No, I didn't go to Macau because their film festival was online this year, like many other film festivals around the world. In fact, I read last night that the Berlinale, which is taking place in February, has the, they announced yesterday that they were going to be online. I think, were they online last year? I can't remember. I don't think they were online last year, but they're definitely going to be, or this past, this year, you know, February, but next February they will be online. So we're going to be seeing that for a little while yet. Now, the, um, yeah, normally I go to the uh, International Film Festival in Macau. This is their fifth year. I went to the first one, didn't go to the second one, went to the third, went last year for the fourth. This year, very strange. Ugh, I don't know what happened, but their PR people, their PR people are useless every year. But this year, they were really useless. They, they, didn't, they didn't promote their festival at all. Um, nobody knew about it. And including me, like I, I kept emailing them going, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? And they're like, yeah, whatever, you know, and um, so it was not easy to find out what was happening. But um, to their credit, at least they made their films accessible to everybody, not just in Macau, but in Hong Kong as well, for a very cheap price of 50 Hong Kong dollars, or I suppose 50 patakas as well in Macau, in Macau. 50 Hong Kong dollars is about, what, about $8 US. So, you know, that's, that's pretty good. But, you know, like the tree that falls in the forest that nobody hears, um, if a film festival takes place and no one knows about it, does it take place at all? So, look, people from Macau who are doing the film festival next year, you know, you gotta get your shit together. I mean, this is ridiculous already. Anyhow, at this year's film festival, which took place two weeks ago, um, there were 31 films screened. Um, as far as I know, and you know, there was no PR about it at all. Um, only about a half a dozen films were, uh, about, you know, half a dozen or so, were Asian premieres. Um, but even more disappointing than that um, for cinephiles, people who go to film festivals, at least two of the films are already available on streaming services. I reviewed Relic uh, back in July and First Cow and back in August. First Cow, by the way, you should check out. Um, on, the, on the plus side, though, um, there were a few films that are receiving Oscar buzz. Um, and one of them is Danish director Thomas Vinterberg. He did um, The Command, The Commune, which I absolutely hated, and The Hunt, which I absolutely loved. Um, now he's got another film called Another Round, and that's what I'm going to talk about right now. Now, in another round, we have Martin, who's played by his go-to guy, Vinterberg's go-to guy for many films, Mats Mikkelsen. Um, he, uh, he was, he was the star of The Hunt, but we also know him from At Eternity's Gate and Charlie Countryman. He played a bad guy in Charlie Countryman. Um, and, of course, TV's Hannibal. Now, Martin is a history teacher at a high school in Copenhagen. And like his friends and colleagues, we have gym teacher Tommy, played by Thomas Bo Larson, who was also an aunt. We have music teacher Peter, paid, played by Lars Ranthi. He was uh, in the commune and also in the hunt. Uh, and sociology teacher Nikolai, played by Magnus Milang. He was in the command and commune. So these are guys that Vinterberg regularly works with. So Martin is having a midlife crisis of sorts. And his students seem just as bored with his teaching as, as he is. And even Martin's home life isn't very good. His wife, Annika, played by Maria Bonvi, um, she, she, it seems, you know, and, and it's probably true, but, you know, we see it early on. She's taking night shifts at the hospital to avoid spending any more time with her husband than absolutely necessary. Now, all their lives change when Nikolai comes across a study by a Norwegian philosopher, and this is true, actually, by a Norwegian philosopher, Finn Skarderud, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, claiming that a man's innate blood alcohol level is too low, and... If you drink to a blood alcohol level of 0.05%, it will improve your performance. This is, this is a real study. 
<laughs> leave it, leave it to the, you know, the the Scandinavians to come up with something like this. Now, with that, the men start downing a swig of this and a glass of that, and meeting after classes at the end of the day to document their experiences because you know they're they're going to be very scientific about it. Now, very quickly, they all notice that they have newfound springs in their steps, and their students start rep responding in a positive way. But, not surprisingly, the inevitable happens when their day drinking starts getting out of hand. Like, who saw that coming? <laughs> you know? Now, Mickelson has said in an interview that in Denmark, if you put a bunch of bottles of wine on the table, everyone will stay until the last drop is drunk. Now, whether that's a love of drinking, or an alcohol problem depends on your culture, I, I suppose. Now, Martin and Vinterberg, by extension, because he wrote the script, he makes the point that if Churchill wasn't such a heavy drinker, would he have agreed to Operation Dynamo? Similarly, he asked his students, Martin asked his students, if Hitler, who never drank a drop of alcohol, had taken a drink or two, would he have made better choices that could have won the war for the Nazis? <sighs> now, that's a little bit of stretch, that's a bit of a stretch, but okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, you know, you know that one—that one sort of bothered me. But anyhow, Vinterberg has called another round a celebration of life, and the film's closing scene certainly reinforces that position. Now, while many find that scene to be exuberant, yeah, I mean, yeah, okay, I'll grant it that. I also found it rather sad at the same time because Martin makes a choice that may not be in his best interest in the long term. You know, happiness is never found at the bottom of a bottle, or if it is, it doesn't last for very long. Ask any reformed alcoholic or anybody in their family and they'll tell you that. Now, Vinterberg, though, he loved to push the envelope on social issues. You know, he did with the commune, he did with uh, the hunt to a lesser extent, but this is his shtick. You know, so he loves to push these social issues, especially Danish ones. And, um, you know, so here he's pushing another one as well. Now, Mickelson and all the other men, they all do great work playing closeted drunks. You know, there's a fine line between underplaying it. You know, you know, you know, you know the, the, if you've ever been drunk and tried try to have it that people don't know that you're drunk. You know, so there's that, there's that, and they do that well. And then there's, of course, when you can't hide it anymore. And then, you know, then it, you know, be, maybe it becomes overacting at that point. So there's a real fine line that these guys had to had to walk and they found it, you know, so that was, that was quite good. Now in that interview that I was mentioned, that I mentioned before, Mickelson joked that they had considered doing some of the scenes while they were drunk, but that would have meant being in that state for 12 hours at a time. And that's not easy. <laughs> it's not even healthy. Now, while the camera work tends to mirror the men's state of inebriation, you know, as they get drunker, it gets a little bit wobblier and, you know, the camera goes like this, you know, as if, you know, somebody is, is is uh, unsteady on their feet. I was I was a little surprised. I was even disappointed that their perceptions of their teaching abilities matched reality. I honestly thought, you know, as as they thought they were becoming better teachers and they thought the students were responding to them, I thought that was all in their head. I thought that was their drunken perception, but it wasn't. They were they actually did get better teacher be, become better teachers to a point. Now um, so I would say again, you know, I think Vinterberg's advocating getting drunk. You know, this is he's advocating for Skardert's thesis. Now, another round has been nominated by Denmark for the best international feature category at the 93rd uh, Academy Awards, which will take place, we already know, at the end of April. And so I guess I think we'll find out at the end of March if this film makes the short list. In the meantime, the film started to roll out on its uh, to international uh, markets, you know, going out to cinemas that are still open. I don't think it's available yet. Oh, I also want to say it won a whole bunch of awards last week at the European Film Awards. It won like the big ones. Like, I think it won Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor. I think it won a fourth one as well. So, um, yeah, the Europeans are responding to it. Um, I don't think it's available yet on a streaming service. If it is, let me know because I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there. But um, as far as, you know, when I was doing, checking to see if, if, where it's playing, um, I don't think it's available on streaming. But certainly, you know what? Watch out for it. And you can decide whether it's uplifting or 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 not. Um, certainly, the acting is very good. I'll you know I'll give I'll give the guys that much credit. The acting is very good, and it's an inter it's an interesting thesis. So that's called another round, or in Danish druk. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Druk. I'm sure my Danish friends will tell me if it's not. Druk is like drunk, but without the end. All right. So that's that one. Second film I want to talk about. Let me just 
close it's I got the, the light is is giving me a lot of glare here the second film I want to talk about is uh, what am I going to talk about I'll talk about sound of metal next this is this is actually a really good film um, and it's getting a lot of buzz actually now sound of metal I'll, tell, I'll just dive right into it. This is um, a, a film about uh, a young man named Ruben. He's played by Riz Ahmed, who uh, you would know from The Sisters Brothers. I think he was one of the better parts of that movie. Um, and um, he's been in a few other things, but I, I only have seen him in The Sisters Brothers, and I was very impressed with that. He is, he's a British guy, by the way, and he's a rapper. He is, a, in this movie, he's a drummer, and he's one half of the grunge metal duet known as Black Gammon. Great name, Black Gammon. That is fronted by his girlfriend, Olivia Cook, um, who we would know from Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. I had no idea. She's British. Because in Me and Girl and the Dying Girl, she's she's got an American accent. But she is British. Um, now, when he suddenly loses 80% of his hearing, Ruben's doctor tells him that he can consider getting cochlear implants. You know, those are those things that go right there. Um, to correct it. But in the meantime, he's got to eliminate all exposure to loud noises. Now, for Ruben, who's a recovering drug addict and has been clean for four years, the news that his drumming career is essentially over is devastating. His Naranon uh, sponsor recommends that he go to a community for recovering adults, addicts who are also deaf, um, and it's run by a fellow by the name of Joe, who's played by Paul Rassi. Um, I don't, I've never seen him in anything. Um, but um, Joe is a supportive but no-nonsense recovering alcoholic who lost his own hearing in the Vietnam War. Now, Joe encourages Reuben to embrace his new situation, and Reuben does to some extent. But all Reuben really wants to do is get the operation, return to Lou, resume, and resume their music career together. But Lou, meanwhile, you know, she's been apart from him for a while. She's reconnected with her father. Richard, played by French actor Matthew Amalric. We would know him from At Eternity's Gate and Sink or Swim. He's a very famous French actor. So um, Ruben's in for a big, big surprise. Now, this is this is a feature. This is by this film is by first-time feature director Darius Martyr. He was the screenwriter for The Place Beyond the Pines, which was the um, the movie with uh, Ryan Gosling from a few years back. So this is his first time in the director's chair doing a feature. I think he's done some shorts. But anyhow, he also wrote the screenplay along with his brother Abraham. And, and I think this is a real powerful story about lo losing the things that give us stability set against the backdrop of addiction and instability. So, you know, we've had, we've had movies where... Uh, somebody uh, gets thrown uh, f for a loop, but nothing quite like this. Now, Ahmed delivers a real masterful performance here. He just blows me away. Um, he portrays a young man who's shoved onto a new path in life and must find the courage to accept it because he knows all too well that if he doesn't, he's going to end up dead, essentially, ultimately. You know, um, he, know he knows what's at stake. Um, now, Reuben, we learn, even with all his tattoos, he's got like his head-to-toe tattoos, his bleached hair, he's a little twitchy, you know, he's essentially a good guy who made bad choices early in his life. Uh, you know, and so, you, you know, you, you, I think that, you know, the instinct, you look at him, you go, yeah, you know, but, but when you get to know him, you think, you know what, he's really a good guy who made some mistakes, you know, but he's really trying to do the right thing. That he, you know, of course he still makes mistakes in the movie, but but you think, you know what, he's really trying to do the right thing. And and you know what, I, I think I, that really appealed to me. That, that sort of character really, I like that character. Now, he knows he's just one hit away from relapse. And unfortunately for him, the things that, that got him clean can't give him his old life back as much as he wishes that they would. Now, to its immense credit, Sound of Metal never tugs at the heart spring, heartstrings. It doesn't follow the tack of so many, whoa, that's, a, that's called Triumph of the Spirit films. There's no equivalent scene here where he runs up the steps of the Philadelphia Museum of Art or he wakes up one morning to find that he can perform again. This is not that kind of film, and I'm really glad it wasn't that kind of film. Um, instead, Ruben's light bulb moment, or actually he had many light bulb moments in, in the story, they come in the most 
subtle of ways. You know, when he least expects it, he, he realizes what he needs to do. Now, surprisingly, for a movie about a musician, Sound of Metal has almost no scale, score. I was That was really, you know, well thought out. You know, we have sound editor Nicholas Becker, who was a Foley artist on Suspiria and Gravity. A Foley artist is the guy who does the sound effects. Um, you know, the shh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so he's done the, the, the sound editing here, and he's created a soundscape that immerses the audience into Ruben's world. We hear what he hears. It's muffled, it's distorted, and sometimes it's nothing at all. Um, I understand in, in some places, or maybe, maybe uh, um, I, I didn't see it, but you know, I understand it's, it's shown with uh, closed captioning subtitles. Um, intentionally. I didn't see it with subtitles. I actually liked not seeing it with subtitles because I liked the feeling of not hearing clearly. So, um, I don't know, maybe some places they do show it with subtitles, but anyhow. Um, or probably for the intent of, of not hearing uh, people, you know, so that they can enjoy the film. But but to me, this, this, this ability to really get into Ruben's world makes us understand his frustrations and choices all the more. Now, Sound of Metal is streaming now on Amazon Prime Video. Um, I don't know, check it out with or without subtitles. Um, this is really one film you shouldn't miss. And I wouldn't be surprised if Ahmed gets an Oscar nomination for his performance. He's that good. So that's called Sound of Metal, Amazon Prime Video. Check it out. Finally, the last film I want to talk about... That's clear coming through here. Wow. <laughs> I can't see anything. Okay. Oh my God. The last one I want to talk about is. Um, uh, hold on a second. Bear with me. Okay. It's also on Amazon Prime Video. I wasn't sure. I wanted to say, but I wasn't sure. It's called Black Bear. And this is a film starring Aubrey Plaza. Now, if you. Um, she's the. Um, Former uh, actor, one of the actresses, one of the star actors from Parks and Recreation, TV's Parks and Recreation, where um, one of the Chris's was, uh, w uh, was starring on for many years. And last year she was in uh, Child's Play, the, um, the reboot of the Chucky franchise. And so she, and also she's getting a lot of buzz because last month she was in a movie called Happiest Season, which was the first, um, was it the first? Or is probably you know the most prominent of the uh, of the uh, of, uh, Christmas f movies featuring an LGBTQ character, and she plays the wrong ex the wronged ex girlfriend in that movie. She got a lot of positive buzz for that. Now she's in Black Bear, a film that she uh, also uh, co produced, and she's getting a lot of good reviews for this one too. Now in this movie, she plays Allison, a former actress who's now turned her attention to writing screenplays, and it seems that nobody wants to hire her because as an actress anymore because she's difficult to work with. Now to get some inspiration for her next project, she heads off to a secluded home in the Adir Adirondacks. That's north of New York, if you don't know. Um, as and it's the the home is owned by uh, a couple, Ga uh, Gabe. <clears throat> Played by Christopher Abbott, who was in uh, First Man, A Most Violent Year, and TV's Catch-22. And his pregnant wife, Blair, played by Sarah Gaddon. Um, I've never seen her in anything. I don't know who she is, but she was very good here. And they're a bohemian couple from Brooklyn who themselves struggle to make a go of their careers in the arts. He's a musician. She's a dancer. Neither of them was very successful by their own admission. So they decided he owned this home through his family. So they decided to turn it into like an Airbnb for artsy people. Now, um, Gabe and Blair have hefty marital issues. He's completely misogynistic and she's passive aggressive. And it's not long before Allison finds herself caught in the middle of one of their many arguments. And, you know, it's going along like that. And then suddenly the movie ends because we learn that was all fiction. That's, that's not what the movie's about. It turns out, maybe, that Allison is still an actress who's starring in a movie directed by her husband, Gabe. And her co-star in the film is Blair, whom Allison thinks is having an affair with Gabe. 
Now, unlike the fictional Blair, though, uh, the real Allison has good reason to question her husband's fidelity. Gabe and Blair have made it look like they're, they're doing the dirty deed together to get Allison, who's like this consummate method actor. They want her to find the right motivation for her character in the film that they're making within this film. So it's, this is a movie with a film within a film. And what we saw, or what we're, what we're led to believe that we saw in the first half, was maybe a first draft, you know? So what's this got to do with a black bear, you ask? Well, to be honest, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know? Other than a bear seems to be lurking outside the luxury cabin. Maybe Allison is the black bear in this threesome. I, you know, I wasn't quite sure where, where, what the connection was. But furry, furry wild animal notwithstanding, Writer-director Lawrence Michael Levine, who did a film called Wild Canaries about eight years ago, he's created this very quirky story that takes audiences on a bumpy ride into the mind of a screenwriter. And it's hard to know what's real and what's imagined. As early on, Allison tells Gabe, when he's not her husband, uh, <laughs> that she lies about everything. So the fictional Allison tells the fictional Gabe that, that she lies about everything. So is Allison a working actress? Is she an actress turned screenwriter? Or maybe she's just crazy? I don't know. It's hard to tell. And Black Bear will certainly keep you guessing all the way until the closing scene. And even then, it'll take some analysis to, f to figure it all out. Um, yeah, I'm going to leave it like that. You know, for her part, Plaza's performance and now legendary side glances, she does great side glances, they make the film work because they force the audience to try to get a handle on who Allison really is. You know, is she the victim here or is she the perpetrator? You know, this is, this is what you're going to have to figure out yourself, for yourself. Black Bear hints of something that we might expect from Charlie Kaufman or maybe John Cassavetes. Oh, so, yeah, I can see, you know, it's, it's, it tends in that direction, but it's not as sophisticated or polished, but it's not bad. You know, I think it's a pretty good film, not, but not in that league. Now, Abbott and Gadon, they, they provide good support work here, both as the fictional and the real Gabe and Blair, or maybe, maybe they're all fictional, I don't know. The film within a film also features another, a number of other actors, um, all of whom seem to have their foibles, that they have little to do with the main focus of the film, and maybe they're only there to illustrate to audiences how chaotic and spontaneous an indie film shoot may be. And there's also a running gag involving cups of coffee that seems to follow that thesis. Now, while Black Bear has its moments of brilliance, it's not going to be to everyone's taste. I think people are going to find this a little bit too weird. Um, the first story that we have with, with Allison and, and Gabe and Blair being the, the, um, the luxury cabin owners, I thought that was more interesting than the second part where they're making the movie. Um, and one may wish that maybe Levine had stayed in that orbit rather than shooting for the moon. It would have been a very different movie if he had, but you know, that, that first part was actually the more interesting part of the movie. So anyhow, I'd say check it out. It's a very challenging film to watch for sure, but I think it's it's well worth checking out. It's an interesting idea. The, the acting is really good. Aubrey Plaza is wonderful yet again. So there you go. Black Bear, it's available now on Amazon Prime Video. So that's it. So I've got two films this week. They're both available on Amazon Prime Video if you're stuck at home, if, you're, if your cinemas are closed, ours are still closed, but there's talk that they're going to open up right after the new year. I'm already starting to get... Um, emails from our local distributors promoting films. Um, so um, it seems that they know something that we don't. Um, but I guess it all depends on the numbers. So that's it. Have a wonderful few weeks. Have a great holiday. Um, please, you know, this is a difficult time, especially if you live in the United States. Maintain social distancing as much as you can. Wear a mask everywhere. Wash your hands lots of times and do all those other things. And hopefully we'll get through this. We're almost done. See ya.